Well, hello everyone and and welcome again to the Humans and Wildlife show. Uh, with me is my co-host as always, uh, Dr. Georgia Oteri. Georgia, how are you and what have we got today? Hi everyone. Yeah, it's good to it's good to be here again as always we are every week. Um, I've been doing pretty good, Christian, since you mm -hmm. asked. I just got <laughs> back from the Evolution Conference um, just wow. a few hours ago. Yeah. How are you doing, Christian? Very well. I'm here in the Okanagan amongst wildlife, so I'm in my element. So I'm all fine. Thank you. Yeah. So today okay. we have mm -hmm. um, a guest, as we often do. And I'm so excited about the topic for today's show. So we're going to be talking to Jeffrey Rich. Jeff Rich. And Jeff um, has two bachelor's degrees, one in wildlife biology, another in biology that he got in the um, 80s. He also has a master's in science teaching. And the thing that sparked us to bring Jeff on the show as a guest is that he recently came out with a book, his third book called Bald Eagles in the Wild, a visual essay of America's national bird. So as you might guess, Jeff is um, a wildlife and nature photographer. And so we're excited to chat with him about his book and as well as about um, hopefully he'll share some videos and pictures with us. So Jeff, welcome to the show. Well, thank you. Yeah, and it's great to be here. Very, very much so. And my topic is kind of right up your alley there with the uh, wonders of wildlife. So, uh, yeah, I hope you Jeff, enjoy you it as much as we, we, we got the cracky microphone again. So, yeah, I, I... could you turn your mic off and on? Yeah, thanks. Okay, Hello. we will Hello. do that. How Persistent about that? Problem. Can any better? Yes, perfect. perfect. Yeah. Got it. Got it. Got yeah. it. Good. Okay. Yeah. So thank you so much for joining us, Jeff. And hello um, also to all of the people commenting from YouTube and Facebook and Twitch where we live stream. Um, so Mike, David, Ram, uh, Gentleman Ghost, and Karen, Susan North. Thank you everyone for joining. Um, and yeah, it's always great to hear from you. So Jeff, as I understand, you have some media to share with us. I sure do. I put together a program that I hope uh, everybody will enjoy right up my alley. And I'm calling it Wonders of the Wilds. Oh, well, Jeff, I, should, I should note too that Jeff is joining us from Oregon. And exactly. Yeah. That's what I was going to say. <laughs> yes. Yeah, yeah I live on the south. Southwest corner, the extreme southwest corner of Oregon on the Pacific Ocean in a beautifully rural, uh, wildlife rich, nature rich area. So I, I live in what I often refer to as heaven. Yeah, that sounds beautiful. And we have some people um, joining in from very beautiful, exotic places as well. It sounds like Tina Jones tuning in from Gabriola Island, home of Malala and Junior. Yeah. <laughs> And um, yeah, and it's, it's great to see you. So yeah, tell us, what, what are the wonders of the wilds? What do we have to look forward to here? Wonders of the wilds is a, a pretty broad topic. So I'm trying to narrow it down into uh, a time frame that we have, of course. And I want to focus on the fact that wonders of, of the wilds is a celebration of life and all things living. I want to categorize it into six categories that I chose. Uh, biodiversity, beauty, through my storytelling, the miracles of Mother Nature, the healing of Mother Nature, and a little more about what I do, sharing my photography along the way. Now, biodiversity is um, one of the most important things, definitely, on Earth. Uh, we, we see it as humans through human eyes. And some of us forget to look through biodiversity and the planet Earth and all things on the Earth through the other lenses of maybe the plants and animals that also share planet Earth with us. And as humans, we benefit and we think about benefiting from biodiversity. We get our food, our wood, our shelter, medicines, paper, we benefit directly through those things. Uh, indirectly, some of us don't quite realize maybe that we also benefit indirectly because of the ecosystem servicing and maintaining things like nutrient cycling, habitats for life, 
the air quality, our climate, big deal these days, of course, water quality, all these things uh, we benefit from directly from biodiversity. And our planet is extremely diverse, not only in bio, also in the abiotic factors as well, the air, the nutrients, and so many other things. Today, I wanna to focus mostly on the life, the wilds. And the diversity is extremely diverse, hence the name, from things like this walking stick. And we have some extremely endangered, critically endangered species like the great green macaws. And of course, we have species that have gone extinct. These are beautiful photos. Um, and I just want to answer, we're so, I feel so terrible. We have a comment from David Howden. My US geography stinks. Where the heck is Oregon? It's in the Northwest of the United States, what we often call the Pacific Northwest. And it's very, um, well, I guess Jeff, you could tell us better. Just above but, California. A lot of people know the California mm -hmm. geography, but you, you hit it right on the head. And Oregon is the state right above California. And then there's Washington going north and then Canada where, where Christian lives. And the, the habitats like the rainforests uh, are so valuable to uh, all life on earth. And supporting those and preserving those has become beyond critical, like these howler monkeys. And if you turn your, uh, you know, your, uh, if your volume is good enough, sometimes when I play these video clips, uh, the volume hopefully also is coming through at a loud enough clip for you. And sometimes I wonder when I'm looking through the lens, it's like, why do things look the way they look? What is it that has created such diversity and such beauty and such interesting things? It's a fun thing for me to think about. And of course, biodiversity I talked about how it helps humans and our lenses and how we basically view most of our world through how things benefit us as humans. Uh, but biodiversity also has a uh, intrinsic value of nature working. Just the fact that nature and all the systems in nature work uh, it shouldn't give us just benefit to uh, humans, but it should also give these systems the right to survive, yes. to continue yes. to exist. Yeah, Jeff, sorry, you're, for some reason you're mic'd again. Really? Yeah, sorry about that, but. Uh... And we didn't do anything different. Yeah, sometimes you just have to add and, and um, take away. Yeah. Um, so we have a again, comment. How's that doing? You sound perfect. We okay. have a question. <laughs> Perfect person, or a comment, I guess, from Chris Scarpetti. Perfect person for my question. I live in Chicago suburbs. We have medium-sized green parrots here year-long. Oh, about six years. How is this possible? Well, you could probably help me with the answer, uh, Georgia, but um, parrots and a number of other species that, that we have on Earth, for the most part, uh, have become invasive species. Um, and so I'm not sure about your particular uh, parrot and population of parrots, but once we bring species of plants and animals from other places, they can take over. Uh, and there's a lot of stories, uh, particularly about parrots and populations of parrots throughout our country, or the USA, I'm sorry, my country. And, um, and they're not always good for the environment and the current ecosystem that never housed them. A lot of other things can happen. Don't know if I answered your question, but if you want to add to that, Georgia. Yeah, definitely. I mean, so part of it is that cities are warm and people will put out bird food year round. So that is what helps, as Jeff was talking about, that can help facilitate um, the birds just like hanging out in the city year round. Normally, before there was bird food out or something like that, they would, you know, like like your hint, like um, like the commenter is hinting at, like Chris is hinting at. The birds would probably die in the winter without any food and they're used to living in the tropics. But because we've created these urban heat areas, these cities where there's a lot of pavement, it stays warmer and people put out bird food, the parrots are able, they're now able to live there year round. And I had not heard of that happening in Chicago though, but I know that it had happened in um, San Francisco is famous for a flock of parrots 
there, like you were saying. So I'm like, oh, wow, I'm going to have to look this up. Yeah, it's apparently a phenomenon that's being facilitated in other cities now. By the way, just parrots, you know, there's a number of other species that have also uh, been doing doing that. Uh, yeah. Yeah, Jeff, we have another question for you from Gentleman Ghost. Does Jeffrey modify his pictures or is he tempted to when he gets pictures that they are almost perfect? That's always a good question. <laughs> yeah, and, and it makes you wonder if, if mm. the person asking the question is a photographer or not. So my philosophy, I've been doing photography since the 1980s and I sold my first pictures to Audubon magazine in 1987 back when we had film and we were shooting slide film and there was no manipulating uh, possible back in the day. So today with the technology that we have, um, what I do in the computer after I've taken the picture, so I strive to get the best picture I can in the camera, that's still my goal. Uh, but in the computer after the fact, uh, the only thing I'll do is do a little minor correction with exposure uh, get the color correction, maybe, and then I do some cropping uh, to make it just what I think is perfect. But I don't use Photoshop, um, and I don't make major changes like that. That's just my personal uh, way I attack it. Yeah, and you do have a book on photographing um, on photographing birds, so I'm sure anyone who's looking for extra tips can take a look there. Yeah. Um, yeah, as well. The Complete Guide to Bird Photography. And I, I, I've got some pictures of it a little later so we can get to it uh, and talk a little bit more about it if you'd like. But, yeah, but back yeah. to uh, biodiversity and, uh, and just humans thinking that maybe uh, nature and, and biodiversity systems have their own intrinsic continue to exist. Uh, which is also a direct, indirect benefit for humans as well, because if we could only see it. We have trees like the redwoods that are huge and giant. They're spectacular. And we have very little original old growth forests left and all the ecosystem around that old growth forest disappearing fast. The second part of biodiversity, I wanted to talk about nature's beauty. Now, through human eyes, nature's beauty is uh, obviously in the eye of the beholder. Uh, but there's certain things that most everybody can agree on as beautiful. I'm always looking for nature's beauty. That's basically my job in a sentence. I always love a beautiful rock photo as a rock climber. <laughs> I'll bet, and especially from Utah, probably even. And how these critters get so beautiful. And if you look at a scarlet macaw and you look at the color, you see color, that in itself is beautiful. You look at the eye, that in itself is beautiful. You look at the wrinkled skin around it and then an individual feather. Spectacular beauty. Now, as humans, we don't always see things like this maybe as beautiful. But they are beautiful if you're a bird and you're hungry and you're coming down, swooping up a mosquito. And we would be thankful if a bird did that. We would be thankful if we got rid of all mosquitoes. But how does it affect the rest mm -hmm. of the biodiversity on Earth? Now, I talk about Mother Nature. It's um, more of a term for me that means... Oh, your mic started doing the thing again. Yeah, turn it off and on, please. And wow. I'll just I'll just comment That's... quickly on a question from Tina Jones. Perhaps we could speak to avoiding uh, feeding the birds due to avian flu. Um, Tina, you're absolutely right that avian flu is a problem right now. It's a disease that's being spread about, around between wild birds. Um, and uh, where it where it's popping up is has a real geographic distribution. So it's not necessarily everywhere. So definitely wherever you are. Um, check out and see if there's an alert um, that you shouldn't be feeding your bird feeders or that there's a lot of avian flu there. Because just as Tina is alluding to, if avian flu is popping up in the um, in the birds, then having them all cluster together, together at a bird feeder facilitates them passing the disease to each other. So it can be good to avoid feeding the birds. Yeah, if you have avian flu in your area, check it out. 
All right, your mic sounds good, Jeff, yeah. Oh, okay, good, well, that's good news. I guess we have to do that every few slides. Um, and uh, along the lines of bird feeders, uh, of course, George is correct, uh, but taking it a little step farther, you know, there's other diseases. Uh, you need to keep your bird feeding stations clean. Uh, other diseases can be spread that way too. Now, uh, when I talk about mother nature and mother nature as a whole, to me, it's just everything on planet earth that has to do with life and sometimes not life, the abiotic factors as well. Like a raindrop can uh, become a prison prism <laughs> and spread the, uh, the, the light rays through the uh, colors of the spectrum, the Roy G. Biv. And sometimes we can get all those colors, red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, and violet in one bird, the indigo uh, bunting. It's just, to me, amazing. The beauty, the color, the toes, the length of the toes, the ability to walk on lily pads. It's beautiful. Yeah, you know, you know what's so interesting about that um, I especially like the color blue. And what's interesting is there seems to be no natural pigmentation um, in, you know, in nature that creates blue. So blue is mainly created through iridescence. And um, just when you when you're talking about optical effects, that that's what's so fascinating you know, uh, about the color blue in nature. And it's it's just amazing. You know, you can see it on this beautiful bird here. So anyway, Jeff, go on. <laughs> yeah, and thank you for that, that mm -hmm. insight. It's so mm -hmm. true. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and so biodiversity, I mean, look at all these pictures. Everything is so different, diverse. Uh, it's, it's beautiful in, in their own way, the Kiel Bill Toucan. Uh, I remember mm -hmm. from eating Fruit Loops when I was a child. And of course, red, uh, I like red. Red's always kind of a nice addition in a photograph, mm -hmm. a nature photograph, uh, the strawberry uh, dart frog, a poison dart frog. And oftentimes, these brightly colored things are all, often come with toxins and are poisonous. Interesting how these brightly colored things are a warning to um, others not to eat them. Personally, I, I also see beauty in, in action and interaction. Uh, I love babies and parents uh, interacting with one another. It's one of my favorite subjects to photograph, and I see beauty in that. Sometimes the beauty is only a mother could enjoy. <laughs> King vultures from yeah, beautiful um, Central America are mm -hmm. gorgeous. And then I like to capture uh, the things that I think are really the photograph. And in this case, to me, the color of the head as uh, just after it was drinking water. It's like my dog, it uh, drinks water and then drips all around afterwards. I love to tell stories, you know, biodiversity, beauty of nature through my storytelling. Uh, the last couple of years, I've been working on a peregrine falcon story. A uh, couple, you know, reasons. One, it's the world's fastest thing on, mm. on the planet. It's nature related. Uh, they can dive over, uh, over 100 miles an hour, extreme diving down to catch birds in flight. Yeah, and we do have um, a couple, well, a couple of comments I want to address, but one is that okay. um, a lot of these photos seem to be of um, birds from tropical places, not necessarily the Pacific Northwest where you live. Um, and so, yeah, do you travel a lot for your photography? I do. And uh, I'm one of those lucky people that uh, the next sentence after uh, my description of what I do is I basically, I travel the world photographing nature and wildlife. Yeah, and so just, I love so just, I love the yeah, tropics. You are, you are a full time photographer right now. Yes. Correct. Yes. And the peregrine falcon nest I'm working is in California, so that's back to North America. Okay. Uh, one of North America's uh, beauties, uh, yeah. and their ability to catch. Did you have another question, George? Yes. Yeah, another quick question that um, it, on your note of why you like going to the tropics because there's so many species there, the biodiversity there is so high. T. A. Yes. Green asks. Do you have any theories on the reasons for the species complexity within biodiversity? Thank you. And I will just, I will answer that. And I will Thank say, <laughs> T.A. Green, if, if you can figure out what the correct theory is for why there's so much biodiversity, um, you will be a famous 
famous biologist, I can tell you. That is one of the biggest questions in the field of ecology and evolutionary biology. Um, I'll give you a couple just examples of a couple competing theories. We don't know which one is correct. One is that um, the tropics have a lot of species because they have a lot of um, niche space. So they have a, basically like it's easy for the species to partition the habitat up into tiny, tiny little areas of specialty. And they're like, I'm going to specialize on this and I'm going to specialize on that. And then you have speciation. Um, a, a related, somewhat related theory is that the tropics are less, um, have less been less climatically variable over time, you know, up at higher latitudes, like here in much of North America, the glaciers have come and gone and come and gone. And over the course of evolutionary time, which is, you know, millions of years, um, it's sometimes very hot and it's sometimes very cold. And so the species in the tropics have had to deal with that to a lesser degree. And so there's this idea that the species down there basically don't keep getting wiped out periodically. And so there's more biodiversity in the tropics compared to higher latitudes. So those, the, the, there's you know, a lot of big questions regarding how, what leads to a lot of biodiversity in nature. And if anyone knows the answer in the audience, let me know <laughs> and I'll, uh, I'll do a study on it and we'll become famous. But yeah, great question. Yeah. It is yeah. a great question. And, you know, that's basically one of the best qualities of, of scientists. And, and that includes citizen scientists. And, and we don't know, um, was it TA? We don't know TA's yeah. background, but uh, asking questions. And those kinds of questions is basically, you know, what science and scientists start with. Uh, and that's a great question. And for me, uh, both those theories, you know, sound reasonable. Um, but I... You know, I'm not one to, to give you an answer. I'm one that captures uh, that diversity and shares it with you and marvels at its amazingness. Yeah, and this um, peregrine falcon in the picture is also marveling at the diversity of nature. And it has some food, it looks like. It's like, look at this type of, look at this type of lunch. Mm. Um, could you, Jeff, could you turn off your mic on and off again? It started to go a bit crackly. And yeah, Lisa... Sexton shares the texture and the colors that pop out make the beauty we can see in ourselves. I couldn't agree more. These are just some really colorful, texturally complex pictures that are very relaxing to look at. Yeah. Thank you. All right, getting back through the vultures and then to the peregrine. Mm -hmm. Yep, and uh, back where I was there, getting the audio mm -hmm. fixed. I guess I, I lost my place <laughs> a little bit. Yeah. So uh, they hunt birds in flight, take them to a perch to feed on them. They'll raise their young on the side of a cliff. This particular nest is overlooking the ocean of California, the western United States. And uh, this is a young one just uh, fledging, about to fledge from the nest. Just came out of the nest, uh, what we call branching or cliffing in this case. There's a video of them sleeping on the And you can hear the wind blowing. Likes to blow a lot on the California coast. Of course, the birds use it to their advantage for flight and gaining flight and notice the feathers ruffled up, uh, picking up every little current of air. Now, if you're another bird and you see a peregrine coming after you, look at that raven. I think that in my human perspective, that raven is scared to death. They'll go after anybody, no matter how much bigger they are, especially if they're around their nest. They want to chase, even though a pelican's probably not going to eat a baby peregrine, they still go after them. Pretty fun to watch these nature shows in front of my lens. They'll also teach their young how to uh, hunt this way. So here's an adult on top with an old eaten up carcass and the young one is underneath. You can see it's a little browner breast, uh, a little different coloration there, kind of one thing at this age shows the young. And the adult will bring the carcass up, the young will come up underneath it. Uh, basically, in my opinion, it's learning how to, to hunt and catch birds in flight itself. Then I watch the adult drop it and watch the uh, young try to, to catch it as it was falling through air. So to me, as a human, I looked at this as, as practice. Uh, this particular time, the young uh, didn't get it, and the adult just went into a stoop and, you know, 
<laughs> had it picked <laughs> off and then went right back up and kept practicing very patient. Wow, that's amazing. I had no idea they did that, like fed their, their young that way. Yeah, and they'll do most of the feeding on the ground. So once they have their bird, or in this case, the carcass, they'll go back to the, the uh, perch to feed on it. But this catching them in the air, pretty cool. Forests are extremely diverse. I mentioned the redwoods, the tallest uh, trees in the world. Aspen trees are pretty, pretty beautiful and mm -hmm. amazing. And people that know of these aspen trees in the Western US or North America know of you know their leaves, the beautiful colors they turn, um, the quaking of the quaking aspen. But one thing that I find fascinating is how uh, aspen groves are basically related to one another. Every tree is kind of a clone of the, the next one. And some research uh, discovered that the largest, anybody know the largest living thing on earth, by the way, since we're asking questions? Oh, well, I think I know, but I'll let people, um, yeah, people put in your guess. What do you think the largest organism on the planet is, the largest living thing? I'm, I'll actually, I'm going to type it in the chat and share it. Um, and in the meantime, maybe we can address some of these audience comments that have come up. I just love, I love hearing the audience perspectives, honestly, about who you are and what you do and where you live. Okay, but audience question as I'm typing it. Um, yeah, what do you think the, the largest living thing in the world is? Um, yeah, and some, some of the comments, we had one, um, Oops, sometimes I try to scroll up and then it doesn't quite work. Um, but we had a comment that, um, yeah, if there's an aspen grove, why isn't my scroll working? Sorry. Well, while you're working on that, I'll just mention that um, mm -hmm. there's a, a really interesting fungus that grows in forests under the ground. And it's a mycorrhizal fungus. And it um, lives in the roots of, of trees and helps trees communicate in, in the way trees do in forests. Yeah, and you know, on the topic of fun, fungi, I think that more and more people are, um, <laughs> are, guess, are becoming aware of this because we have a lot of guesses for fungi in the chat. So that was going to be my guess as well because they have a big underground root system. But perhaps I'm wrong. Yeah. So, you know, and, and I used to say the blue whale, the largest living thing on earth, the blue whale is, is definitely a large animal. But in terms of, of size and, and uh, mass and weight, if you will, um, there's a aspen grove in Utah, which is another state in the United States, is a, a basically a grove of aspen trees that comes from one uh, male tree and the rest of the grove is, has been cloned, and they've seen this through their DNA uh, testing. Sorry, your and mic is goes um, under the record again. as the largest. Excuse me? Yeah, your, your mic, mic, you need to turn it on and off again. This is um, the weirdest thing. I hope we can figure this out at some, for your next it's guest. Not, huh? Yeah, it's not just you. I think we'll have to figure out with, super, with future guests, but um, thank you for Shoot. taking care of that. So am I correct? You're saying that the, the aspen grove in Michigan is actually the biggest thing now? The biggest yeah, so there's an thing? aspen grove in Utah that um, they found to be the largest. Uh, it's over 100 acres. It all comes from one male aspen tree and all the trees around it are clones of that one male. And it weighs over 600,000 kilograms as a grove of, of trees in the aspen world. Pretty cool. And aspen also have these root fungi that so many forests have, these mycorrhizal fungi. Wow. That's amazing. I guess it makes sense mm. because the aspen are connected to each other, just like the the fungi are, but they're much bigger than the fungi. So you don't need. Um, as, exactly. Yeah, exactly. And then you get to think about aspen groves throughout the U.S. and how many aspen groves there are. And no wonder they grow in clumps like that because they're cloning each other all the time. 
Now, the oldest living thing on Earth, uh, I used to always say, was the, uh, the uh, bristlecone pine tree. Well, they've dated this particular clone back uh, 80,000 years. What? So it is now also the oldest living thing on Earth. Wow. I would and like... I want to figure out I have like that's very interesting to me because I'm like ooh I want to know like as a biologist I love learning about types of measurements or things we can infer about organisms that I didn't know there was like a way to do it yet. Um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, there's so much to learn about everything as you know. Um and of course like all forests the aspen uh, groves um they entail everything from the the living things from uh, the earth all the way up above ground, the abiotic non-living things like the air and the nutrients in the soils and the gases that each leaf uh, passes through it on a daily basis. And of course, the large mammals uh, that I love to photograph are in the uh, same area and will pass by and nibble on, on these trees. So they're so uh, giving and rich of, of a little ecosystem. Well, and I know you mentioned that you love storytelling as one of your components of, of your photography and just things you appreciate about nature. I, I read a beautiful passage in a book once about aspen trees and how like, because they're this one big sort of clonal network, the passage in the book described um, a grove of aspen trees. It was like, imagine if you had a grove of aspen trees and as the glaciers come, you know, like hundreds of thousands of years ago and th tens of thousands of years ago, the glaciers come and the aspen tree, the, as one big sort of monster, the grove kind of slowly moves up and down in the countryside as, as it's, you know, it's moving basically through cloning itself and growing new trees at the edge of its, um, at the edge of the grove's like group. So I thought that, I don't know if that's true, if it's, if they can really move that fast and in the context of glaciers, but it's just like an amazing image in my brain. Yeah. Hmm. And I mean, you know, the whole thing is, is amazing of how things evolve and, and change with the changes that happen naturally. Some of the changes are happening a little too fast. And, and so that evolution is having a harder time keeping up. So we've got the biodiversity, we've got the, the beauty, we've got the storytelling, we've got uh, miracles. And, and to me, these are all the same thing. I look at photographing uh, nature as photographing the biodiversity, the beauty, telling the stories, uh, the miracles that occur. It, to me, it's all the same. And, you know, we need to remember when, when we can, no matter where we are, whether we're in our backyard or in the tropics uh, or in India, you know, take a closer look. What's really there? Now, this happens to be the California state flower. Every state in the United States picks a flower that's their icon flower. And the California poppy is for California. And I mean, just to see how the, the sepals come off in one little hat off the top, leaving that reddish ring uh, along the bottom, it's just spectacular. And then they'll open up into their blooms into a gorgeous orange uh, poppy, in this case, surrounded by lupin. So of course, these things we're talking about, to get scientific, uh, these miracles, they're, they're what we call adaptations. Now this bird is adapted to, you can see its point of its beak, very unique for a bird. It's a flower piercer, that's the name of the bird. And they're adapted to pierce through the base of flowers, the bud of flowers to get their nectar and food out. Flower piercer, what a that cool adaptation. A, I love that, yeah, that one of the nectar stealers um, we have a great question from Lori. Do you have a favorite story of capturing a photo on the Pacific coast of Northern California? Well, right now, you know, that current one is my ongoing Peregrine project. Uh, hmm. But yeah, I, I have uh, lots. I've been doing this since the 80s, so I have a lot of fun, great stories. Uh, but I'll go with the Peregrine because it's, it's fresh in, in my mind and what I'm working on. And the fact that in the 80s, when I started photography, and I was in college studying wildlife and bi biology, <clears throat> the peregrine falcon, like so many other species in the United States, were endangered. And I hardly ever saw peregrine falcons. Um, peregrine falcons were going downhill in a big way. And good thing we realized what was causing that through these pesticides 
uh, and some other factors that were declining. Once we realized that, we were able to turn the tide. So to me, it's a, it's a, I love good news stories. That's basically mm. what I, my world, uh, my Pollyanna world, I try to live in. And the Peregrine Falcon is just a story of, of a great comeback. And I see Peregrine Falcons now all along uh, the California, even the Oregon coast. I see them out my my front window now uh, flying by here in Oregon. And they have uh, done quite well, as have bald eagles, which I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about. Can you just switch your microphone again? Just yeah. start again. Sorry. <laughs> well, whilst you're doing that, uh, uh, what's also interesting about the Peregrine Falcon is, um, you know, here in Vancouver, we're seeing more and more, especially in the cities and under the bridges. It's just amazing. They're, so they're, they're doing very well. So They've really come back yeah. for sure. And they, yeah, like, they, to, have. they yeah. like to nest on those cliff sides. And so. Yes, exactly. Um, exactly. We saw those that. Those man-made cliffs. Yeah. 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 It's, yeah, well, it's astounding. It's astounding. And also, as we introduce more, you know, new species of birds, um, which may be foreign species, the peregrine falcons also live on them. <laughs> That's interesting. That's yeah, true. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> they love eating mm. uh, whatever they can catch bird wise, yeah. and they don't care if it's invasive or not. So there is a positive mm -hmm. side, I guess, if you want to look at it that way. Now, zooming in just to go to that theory of, or not theory, but that idea of going closer and looking closer. This is one um, set of flowers on one stalk, and I count four insects. And so yeah. if we could imagine what life at that close range and even under the ground entails and how diverse and how large uh, the number of species are and how they all benefit and work together. We talked about the fungi, the mycorrhizal fun fungi in, in the roots. Uh, a microtroph is a, a plant that gets most of its carbon, if not all of it, from these micro rhizofungi that hook into their host plant. This is a snow plant, a beautiful uh, plant of red color, and it gets its entire nutrition from the, uh, I guess you could call it parasitic uh, sucking of the host plant's nutrition and carbon out of those fungi that they attach to. Jeff, can you, can you quickly um, uh, just comment, Gentleman Ghost is asking about your equipment, he's very curious about the camera in the background. He says, Jeffrey's camera in the background looks suspiciously like Christian's camera. Maybe you can comment on that. <laughs> yeah, us wildlife guys, we have the big lenses, right? Yeah. So uh, I use the Nikon equipment. The one behind That's me is it. my 500 millimeter F4 lens Yeah. Uh, on a, uh, a D5 body. I've recently switched over to the mirrorless camera gear but the long lenses are important yeah when you're photographing wildlife it gives us the opportunity to stay far enough away for the most part uh, that we don't scare our subject and uh, we can get at peace and allow the subject to do its natural behavior and, and then be able mm. to capture that so we need those long lenses so That's gentleman ghost is, is actually correct i also use nikon so you see uh, he's he's very observant he must have seen the similarity so it's true <laughs> very similar and what are you using yeah. now christian well i still use my 800 I, it's my favorite lens it's just it's um uh, it's it's incredible you know it's it's heavier but the optics are just so superb and and you can get so close to things so i'm, I'm still using that yeah good mm. and what body as uh, d5 same as you yeah. d5 yeah yeah you know okay. the thing so it, thing, it looks identical other than your lens is even bigger yeah well you know <laughs> yeah. anyway yeah but but it's interesting I'm leaving, what you, I'm leaving the chat <laughs> yeah but it's, it's interesting what you say about uh, mirrorless because um it's it's true the mirrorless are, are taking over but i don't want to change all my camera gear either you know because that's what some people are doing and it's a huge investment yes it is so so that's that's the you know that's that's a trade-off you have to think about but anyway let's let's no move on okay it's and it was a good observation by that mm, person yeah, because it is yeah. basically the same yes same yes equipment. yeah so miracles of nature uh, how about bird flight bird flight alone to have a uh, birds evolve with hollow bones and feathers so lightweight they can capture the air and propel a bird through 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 air. 
Uh, bats are mammals that can fly. Pretty cool there. I've always wanted to see a bat colony come out of its cave at night. And I've been to Borneo uh, looking for it in some of the caves in Borneo. And finally, I found this spot in the middle of California in a, in a town. It's near the capital of California in uh, near Sacramento, by the way. A friend of mine was telling me about it. So I finally oh. got to go down there just a couple weeks ago. I was down there doing some filming. And I got to photograph the bats wow. in mass coming out just after sunset. And wow. I was spellbound. Amazing. I loved it. I'm, I'm, I'm really impressed. Beautiful. Thank wow. you. And yeah, then to find out. The bat's worst <laughs> nightmare. <laughs> exactly. Then to find out that the hawks have realized this happens in a nightly basis and oh. come after the bats to capture wow. this red-tailed wow. hawk hunting bats as they flew out from their, their uh, daytime roost was really exciting for me. Wow. So here's a little video showing the bats coming through and the hawk coming through. Whew. Did you see the hawk catching any? That hawk was actually carrying one. Oh, wow. I'll play it again. And I, yeah. did, I did see him catch right. them. Okay. Uh, but this was the best picture I got. Uh, That's but it was after the so fact. difficult to follow. Oh, yeah. Oh, my it's goodness. Really difficult to follow. I don't know if you could see the bat hanging out of his talons, but that was just kind of a dream come true for me. Yeah, yeah just switch. Just switch. do the mic thing again. Yeah, my, just do the mic. I mean, yeah. <laughs> The mic trick. <laughs> yeah. And I'll, while he's doing that, I'll answer. There was a question um, mm -hmm. about, does anyone know how these species are doing in Africa or the Middle East? Um, so often, like there's often, but not always, the species that are unique to those areas. Um, and as, as we're learning more and more as conservation <coughs> biologists, we're learning more and more about the solutions to wildlife conservation have a lot to do with the culture of the, the place where we're enacting them. So conservation biology is usually because humans are causing some problem and because humans are so different and our societies are so different in the globe, um, the conservation solutions are very different. And so I'm kind of happy to report that, um, I mean, often species in less developed areas, regardless of where you are on the planet are doing better because there's less people there. In North America and in Europe, we have just kind of wiped a lot of the landscape. We have deforested it. We've built a lot of cities and stuff. Um, and we, yeah, so everywhere is kind of a different, has different sort of struggles with conservation and different priorities, whether it's, you know, rewilding areas that you already destroyed or trying to just, you know, s s halt that process of sort of human destruction or disturbance that has sort of started to get underway where you are. Um, yeah, that's the kind of short answer to a very big question. But yes, back to Jeff, his microphone is hopefully working again. And <laughs> he's brought up a picture of a very weird looking bird. What is this bird? <laughs> this is a boat billed heron. And again, we're talking about, you know, miracles and adaptations. And, and this guy lives in mangrove swamps and scoops up uh, invertebrates and frogs and small animals like that. Giant eyes, because they're mostly no nocturnal. Uh, just so cool to have these unique things on Earth. One of my favorite stories of, oh my gosh, does anybody even know about this? Is the story of the ice worms. I don't know, I don't know if anybody's that. heard about ice worms, but I heard about ice worms back in the, in the 90s, 1990s. Mm -hmm. And here's a black one up top next to a dime for size. They're tiny little guys. They'll live on... Uh, the surface of glaciers in Alaska, oh. Canada, Washington, and Oregon. They're related to the earthworm uh, that we have here, the common earthworm. They're an annelid family. Uh, and I just found out about these and thought, how can a worm live on ice in Alaska all summer and winter? It's miraculous. They'll feed on the, uh, the dirt and duff that lands on top of the glaciers throughout the season. I did bring up a little video if, if we want to learn more about them. They're pretty pretty amazing animals. It's about a two-minute video. Should I show it or keep going? 
show it. Um, so yeah, go ahead and show yeah. it. But let's see if we can actually hear the audio with it. Make sure the audio is on and playing. Yeah. Yeah, and you may have to uh, turn your own audios up too. But let's see here. So is that showing up now? Yeah, that's showing up. Okay, so this is from the Alaska Public Lands Information Center. But for some reason, the I'm audio is not coming hearing closer. the audio. Yeah. I don't know. It looks like it's on on the video. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's just not coming across, Georgia. It's not. Um, so it's not yeah. coming on video. Yeah, uh, yeah. Sound wise, it looks like it's sound is on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It yeah. does it's look not, like the sound not, is on, but we don't hear it. Yeah. Okay, not, well then it's yeah. we probably don't need to watch it. Because okay. it was more about the learning about them I, I, okay. that I found interesting. But that's the general gist of a, of a worm that can live its entire life on ice in the harsh conditions of the top of a glacier in Alaska. Wow. That me, is that wild. Amazing. Ice worms. I love it. What a story. That's the video again. And then another piece I like to talk about is, is how nature is healing. And there's so much science happening now on how people can heal from nature, both physically and mentally. And let me get my slideshow back up. Does it sound good? Yes. All right. So for me personally, I spend a lot of time in nature. And so I can, I think about things like that a lot. I have a lot of time to realize how important being in nature is for my mental health and my happiness. And when I'm not outside photographing uh, after a few weeks i realized i need to go take a walk at least you know and so i've, I've noticed over over the years it's actually a mindset mm -hmm. and my mindset is i'm constantly looking even if i don't have my camera i'm looking for the beauty that that is all around me all the time and because i'm constantly looking for beautiful things i have a beautiful happy mindset and it's extremely <laughs> like good for mental health yeah. Yes, and, and, and that continues for me, by the way, at nighttime when I take my telescope out. So it, it never ends, right? The only thing that you get is really tired. <laughs> so, yeah. But I, I would completely agree with you. It just never ends. It's, it's you know, curiosity, Jeff, is, is one of the biggest gifts that we can have. Either you have it or you don't. I don't think you can really learn it. It's You just have to have be curious you know and you obviously are <laughs> so. and and that's another great uh, feature yeah. that makes a great scientist i believe mm. you know asking good yeah. questions and being curious yeah. yes and and you know i can look up anywhere i am in the world and i can see that full moon and i know that's the same moon any of my uh fellow humans can see at the yes. basically exact same time and it gives me a sense of being at home i just love to look up at a full moon and think about Look at how crazy cool that is, number one. But number two, everybody's seeing it. How wonderful is that? It's healing. Yeah, whilst, well, uh, just sw switch your, yeah, switch your, uh, oh, Bernie crawls it. It's interesting getting to him. Are you uh, wanting my my sound again? Yeah, yeah, yes, yeah, sound, yeah, sound. Whilst, you, whilst you're doing that, at the reason, I'll just tell you something very quickly about the moon that I found so interesting. Recently, um, uh, I was watching the lunar eclipse and it's very interesting as they were showing it from Morocco and, 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 and from Chile and from different uh, um, locations and putting it next to each other. You could really see how, you know, how the Earth's, um, the, the latitude varies and of course the rotation of the moon. Right? Right? And it's very nice, to, uh, very nice to see that. Actually, this is the wonderful thing that we can do nowadays. We can do simultaneous, um, you know, si simultaneous um, broadcasts from different locations and you can really understand much more about nature anyway go on yeah good point uh, mm -hmm. yeah i think i love learning about it and, and mm -hmm. understanding more well there's a couple books i thought i'd share one of them's talking about the healing into the forest there the second one down uh, is a book on some of the science behind uh, a number of other countries uh, japan and, and korea they're big into uh, sending people out into nature to help heal them uh, we actually have doctors now in the united states that have actually prescribed time in nature it's a real thing and it can help a lot of other people. Um, another great book. I mean, if you guys are interested in reading some really cool books on really cool biology, I guess, um, that we don't always get to experience ourselves. If you want to take a photograph of the screen or I don't know if Christian and Georgia will leave it up later, but Wild Soundscapes uh, by Bernie Krause, listening to yes. the sounds of nature 
uh, this man has taken it to a level that is exceptionally enjoyable and very educational. Yeah, Jeff, it's so interesting you, you should mention Bernie. I interviewed him about two years ago nice. um, re remotely, and I should actually, Georgia, we must forget that, I should actually play that. I have everything on recording that um, I interviewed him together, of course, with David Hancock, and it was an incredible um, interview, and it's exactly about that. He has very very well portrayed the loss of 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 sound and how how sound relates to nature and habitat so and and it's incredible his recordings are out of this world i i, I completely agree with you so yeah 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 he mm -hmm. he is uh, pretty amazing to teach us about yeah. the sounds of nature and the fact mm -hmm. that uh, we're losing them <clears throat> a couple other great books i mean there's so many you can do your own searches <laughs> but i love the hidden life of trees you can learn an immense amount of biology about trees and forests. It's like, are you kidding me? Mm -hmm. Are trees really that smart? Uh, yeah, they really are. Uh, the soul of an octopus, world of wonders, uh, the mm -hmm. genius of birds, and then, of course, the classic. Silent Spring, yes. Uh, the classic, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That is just mm -hmm. the, the sad story mm -hmm. of what we've been mm -hmm. doing to our planet for decades. Mm -hmm. If anybody's interested in good books, you want to take a quick picture, I'll leave it up for just a second. Yeah, uh, I'm writing them few. down, and and just so people know, um, I will we will add all of these to our website for the show. So, the um, in the episode description there, we can add links to all of these books, as well as a link to um, Jeff's website where you can see his books and and learn more about him as well. Perfect, and yeah. I'll be talking about my books here. Uh, real soon here as we're finishing up, but there's just so many stories to tell. I just, I can never get enough. Sometimes I'll make the story, um, you know, the bird, the white crown sparrow singing with the American flag in the back, which makes a great July 4th calendar. Unfortunately, I do have to make some money once in a while to continue to do this. And so thinking like this and, mm -hmm. and um, making these stories in a single image uh, has been my my desire and just you know just real quick i'll just buzz through you know volcanoes erupting around the world it's it's gorgeous yeah, wh wh whilst you're doing that laurie's asking uh she's saying wonderful yes it lifts our spirit so true um and then how can we best follow your journey with the peregrine falcon yeah so i will talk about my facebook and instagram page momentarily here okay that would be the best place Good. to follow it thank you okay. for asking i appreciate that Unfortunately, I'm kind of uh, not the best marketer of my stuff, so I put it at the end instead of the beginning. I don't know what the right way to do it is. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, there's some habitats, uh, ecosystems on Earth. One of my favorite is the Pantanal, the largest wetland in the world, the largest wetland on Earth, which is actually in Brazil. And some of the species there are so iconic uh, that it's just uh, incredible to be able to immerse yourself and see some of these things. And we need to preserve more of this kind of stuff. And then the animal behaviors. I mean, we have a thing in science called allopreening, where um, individuals preen one another, whether it be mammals or birds or whatever. Uh, but I had never heard of or never seen two different species. This is a Crested Caracara juvenile and a black vulture uh, allopreening one another. And to me, that was just like, are you kidding me? That is the coolest thing. Got to think about what we do and try to maybe really difficult, perhaps. We need to try to, including me, I need to try to put myself more into the shoes or, if you will, the flippers of other animals and what we are doing to them and how valuable and important they are, not only to our planet, but to our own human population and human health. And of course, the fishing nets are a big issue with a lot of things the entanglement we could go down that story uh it's sad to see it yeah uh, and you tangled in you, the garbage and trash that are out in the oceans yeah and could you restart your mic again um and while he's doing that yeah so there's so much of what jeff is saying is that's making me think of some previous topics that we've had on the um on the show so we had our previous episode where did all the bird song go mm -hmm. about soundscapes and specifically the morning chorus and birds and how it was disappearing and and also we had um 
an episode on the Pacific garbage patch, I will, or oh, yeah. plastic pollution in the ocean. And in that, yeah, one of the surprising things that I learned is that these nets that Jeff is talking about, they actually mm. make up the biggest bulk yes. of the plastic trash in the ocean, these fishing nets. So um, I don't I don't know what to say about about that, except for do what you can to get this kind of thing regulated. Um, maybe I think it's hard to figure out if you're eating fish from a company that buys fish from a company that, you know, that uses nets or discards them. But um, yeah, to, they're yeah, a big, it, big problem. I was surprised to learn. And there's He's, another thing that you mentioned is like, if anybody comes up with the answers to some of these problems, um, you know, it'd be nice to know. And you'd probably be world famous, like you said earlier. Yeah. And of course, the these fishing nets are a huge problem. Yeah, these pictures are part of the problem, though, because I they're very powerful. And I had no idea the fishing nets were so problematic. And just seeing all these photos you have of it, I'm like, wow, these need to be more widely shared. And of course, one thing we can do on an individual basis, but it's not anywhere near the, <clears throat> the billions of people basis, is the plastics, which is another huge thing in the ocean that's causing lots and lots of damage. Another story for another time. Appreciating and valuing what we still yeah, have left is yeah. basically what I live for and getting to see a, a mama grizzly with four uh, newborn cubs and all four of them. Uh, this was two years ago. Just uh, this season came out of hibernation. All four are still alive and the mother just kicked them out. They're now on their own. Just love those good news stories and sharing pictures like this where you just look into the soul of that little baby. Howler monkey just breaks my heart in a good way. I just love it. Melts my heart. Not that breaks it. And then just to, um, you know, appreciate and value and, and the awe that Mother Nature creates. Just imagine the power that creates a wave this large on the uh, Oregon coast here. So a lot of people have been asking about what I do. We've hinted about some of it. I, I kind of saved it for the end. Um, but, yeah, I basically travel the world photographing nature and wildlife particularly. Uh, and and laying in the mud. I spent a lot of time laying down on the ground, getting at eye level with things. And so that's, you know, not as romantic as it might sound. Um, I'm an ethologist, which is basically a scientist of behavior, I'm constantly studying behavior and capturing that uh, with my camera equipment. Here's a, I don't know if you can hear the audio. No, we can't. It looks okay, like okay, but it, my my only... sons were with me on a trip to Borneo. We spent six weeks in in Borneo years ago, and they were filming me. It's a really old video, and um, just taking my kids and other people out uh, is important and valuable. And um, and for me, capturing and immersing myself in the miracles of Mother Nature, uh, Christian probably recognizes this comment from a couple years ago, being our astronomer expert. But I loved being out there and then sharing, sharing these pictures with people is a big part of, of what I like to do. This is Mount Shasta, northern uh, volcano, uh, northern California volcano with the comet on the left side there. My first um, book I said was Baby Birds. I don't have a picture of it. And then I came out with the complete guide to bird photography. It's in its second edition now. Um, I sell photos and articles to magazines and have been since the 80s. Uh, writing books has become a new uh, fun activity for me. And as Georgia mentioned, it's my newest book. It's a couple years old now, uh, but I got to travel around photographing eagles and watching eagles for many, many years. In fact, that's where I met Christian. Uh, we were up in, I was up in uh, finishing my book. I was doing one last series of stories for that book. Uh, I wanted to go to Canada and meet David Hancock a bald eagle expert, and I'm sure you've heard of him if you've seen Christian's other uh, topics. And so I met Christian kind of as a side effect to that. I wanted to interview him and see that phenomenal concentration of eagles and photograph it. And I also uh, wanted to visit a Native American tribe in, in Idaho that was one of the first tribes to get permission to uh, keep rehabilitated eagles in their possession. Um, and so it was kind of the ending of my trip. But bald eagles have been a passion of mine for many years. And one little fact, I mean, you can read a whole lot about it in my book. Uh, one little fact is they are kleptoparasites. What a cool word. And they are gorgeous. They are the United States 
of America's uh, national symbol, national bird. So my website, where you can find a link to my books for sale. Uh, my Instagram is just Jeff Rich Photo. And my Facebook is jeffrey.rich.395. So I can leave that up there. You can uh, also photograph that if, if you need to. Um, I have more we could share, but I think we're about at, at the end of time. So uh, I'll let, um, you know, questions and Christian and Georgia uh, value it from here. Yeah, thank you so much for sharing. And I took a, I took a picture as well, so I can help share that when we post the episode notes as too. Thank you so much, Jeff, for sharing all of your photos and for also the philo your philosophy behind your photos. It's, I think, a very... Um, very like thought out and you articulated it well, sort of what you enjoy about it and what you've learned from all this photography. Um, so yeah, that thank, is- well, Thank you for wonderful. noticing. Yeah. Appreciate that. Yeah, I, I think about it a lot. I love it. It is what I do now all the time. So it's pretty cool. Yeah. And thank you everyone for commenting as always. One of the things I really liked today about the comments, especially was people often post where they're from, but other people were posting like what they do. And like, you know, if you're um, a nurse or like something like that, like I just love hearing about what people do in the world. I think I like to think that we're all trying to make the world better in our own different ways. And we all have our different strengths to contribute and things to learn from each other. So I hope to see more of that in future episodes. Um, but thank you so much, Jeff, for, for joining us. And um, Kristen and I will, will close up here for just a moment. So uh, yeah, thank you, Terry. We love doing the program. Um, and I did want to plug very quickly that there is um, one of our former guests, Ruman Malhotra, who is a carnivore biologist. He becomes Dr. Ruman Malhotra tomorrow. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and put if anyone would like to join his dissertation, um, if anyone would like to watch the, the live stream of his defense, of his PhD defense, um, this is the moment right before he becomes a doctor, basically. Um, I'm gonna go ahead and share the Zoom link. Um, oops, sorry, as I try to pull it up real quick. Um, but yeah, it's it's different format. It's sort of a one-way presentation for the most point, but for the most part, but he does research specifically on how free roaming dogs impact the native wildlife community. Um, yeah, so let me, I had it all pulled up and I'm having like some big computer problems today, of course. Um, I just, my email is not opening for some reason. Well, that's okay, I'll go ahead and, oh, nope, now it is working. Yeah. Um, but it's so great. We've been reworking the, the website lately, so people can go there to hopefully find more information soon. Um, yeah, I am gonna have to show the link later, but I'll go ahead and put it in the comment of the live stream. How's that? So yeah, thank you everyone for joining. Um, Kristen, any final comments? You're muted. I can't hear you, Kristen. That's very strange. It doesn't say that you're muted on the show. Um, well, very interesting. I guess that I we can go ahead and end the live stream very anticlimactically. Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Jack. Thank you, James Bourne. Um, oh, I'm just going to say you know, I, put, I put another mic. There's something going wrong. But any, anyway, I just wanted to uh, uh, say special thanks to, to Jeffrey Rich. This is the second time We've had him now on, on live stream. This was even better than the first one. I already like the first one so much, but this was even better, especially because as you grow older, you get wiser with what Georgia was already mentioning. Uh, with all your wisdom, it just makes it really beautiful. So thank you so much for that. It was very, very special. Thank you. Yeah, I loved it. Um, oh, and I did, oh, I almost pulled up the Zoom link. I have, you know, I have some kind of like strange mouse problems, but let me just go, there we go, finally, and put this link in the chat real quick. So that's the link to a talk happening tomorrow at 9 a.m. Um, Eastern time. 
so you can go ahead and log in. And yes, and some of you know Ruman not just from him talking about dogs and foxes on our show, but um, also he is the husband of Isa, Isa Betabug, who live streams very frequently about insects. Um, so you should definitely check out her live stream, The Bug Scope, if you want to um, be hear about insects every week, which I know it sounds weird, but it's weirdly satisfying <laughs> to watch like all these little bugs crawling around every week and under the microscope, she can film them and stuff like that. So it's cool. Okay. Bye everyone. Thanks for joining us. Yes. Bye. Thank you.